welcome you to this brand new episode of Talking Straight, the exclusive talk show from Intensive Care News Network on some of the most contentious and recent topics from critical care medicine. We all know that timely intervention in mechanical ventilation alarm settings can reduce many iatrogenic and secondary complications. And yet, many a times they act like fair weather friends. That is, they fail to sense when it is needed most. So tonight, our subject is mechanical ventilation alarm settings, strategies, and surveillance. And to discuss this, we have amongst us two eminent experts, Dr. Murli Dhar Kanchi, Chief Cardiac Anesthetist and Intensivist from Narayan Rudala, Bangalore. Welcome you, Dr. Murli Dhar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. We also have with us Dr. Shiva Ayer, Professor and Head of Critical Care Medicine from Bharatiya Vidya Peet, Pune, who has also been the President of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine in the past. Welcome you, Dr. Shiva, in our talk show. Uh, thank you, Anirban, for the kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, I wish to start with Dr. Murli. Sir, we all know that mechanical ventilation alarm settings and their timely intervention can make a big difference in reducing the secondary or the iatrogenic complication. Yeah. In this regard, in this regard, I want to ask you that what are the essential prerequisites that you would look into before uh, determining the ventilator settings, alarm settings? Uh, thank you, Anir Ban, for that uh, wonderful question. We know that one ventilator alarms is the top 10 of health technology hazards. And we also know that uh, once a patient is on a ventilator, there may be as many as uh, 50 to 150 alarms per day per patient, depending upon the criticality of the patient and the situational uh, requirements. So coming to the important prerequisites for deciding alarm settings during mechanical ventilation, we have to determine, first of all, whether it's an invasive ventilation or non-invasive ventilation, depending on which the audible alarms and non-audible visual alerts can be manipulated to ensure safe mechanically ventilated support uh, and have a um, successful um, uh, ventilatory strategy in a given patient. According to me, the uh, requisites will be, first requisite will be what type of ventilator we are using and what are the alarms available in that ventilator. This will be first requisite to know what are the types of al available alarms in a particular ventilator and what are the patient factors. Second uh, requisite will be what are the patient factors? Is the patient obese? Is there in increased intra-abdominal pressure? Is there a pregnancy? What, uh, what is the respiratory status of the patient? Is it a case of increased resistance to um, uh, uh, increased airway resistance or decreased compliance? And uh, coming to the alarms themselves, what are the priority alarms? What are the priority alarms? I mean to say, the alarms which must go on when there is acute situation which can be life-threatening. And what are the patient specific requirements? So these are some of the fundamental uh, requisites we need to know when we decide about how to set the alarms in a given ventilator for a given patient. Thank you. That's right, that's right, Dr. Kanchi. I go to Dr. Shiva here on the are they important? Sir, as we know, that even studies have also shown that only less than 15% of the alarms are actionable alarms, that is, which require some form of intervention. Now, how do you differentiate between actionable and non-actionable alarms in, during mechanical ventilation? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Alarms that are defined as actionable are those which uh, not only require an awareness at the bedside, but also require immediate action, uh, which may be in the form of um, altering the ventilator settings, uh, assessing the patient further to see if uh, the change in alarm settings has caused any change in the clinical status, and 
some of them, uh, especially the most difficult actionable alarms, may be something like a high airway alarm with a low oxygen saturation alarm, where you have to disconnect the ventilator and take the patient on the ambu. So that would be the extreme example of an actionable alarm. And the non-actionable alarms, may, if you ask me, actually, I don't think that uh, any alarms would be completely non-actionable because that would be a uh, that that would be an oxymoron, you know. So you're saying alarm and you say non-actionable, whereas alarm is meant for some kind of action. So even the non-actionable alarms are going to be those which will require a clinical awareness and will then uh, necessitate, if they are frequent enough, some change in setting. A typical example which is quoted for a non-actionable alarm is, a, is an intermittent high airway pressure alarm, which comes and goes. And uh, such an alarm is very common, especially when uh, we are weaning patients or uh, you're not aiming for a very high level of sedation of the patient. So uh, that's a typical example of um, immediate, uh, a non-actionable alarm in the sense it requires an awareness, but does not necessitate any action. I, I, I fully agree with you. You mean to say that non-action is also an action because <laughs> the awareness itself is an action and non-action yes. can also raise awareness that something is not wrong, but yes, it's making a sound. So I move on to Dr. Kanchi again on so one of the most important reasons for which a patient is subjected to mechanical ventilation in all possible scenarios in various circumstances is a ARDS. Now, right. what are the most important parameters of mechanical ventilation settings in an ARDS patient? Uh, thank you for this question. And uh, in ARDS, the primary problem is decreased lung compliance. And to my mind, I think the two important parameters which have to be monitored constantly is the end inspiratory plateau pressure and the driving pressure. Because we need to know that there is no barotrauma nor volutrauma uh, because of high uh, um, uh, inspiratory plateau pressures and driving pressures. Additionally, if you have a mechanism to monitor the dynamic compliance and the static compliance and the level of PEEP, uh, it would be useful. And, uh, and FIO2 monitoring also will be, uh, alarm settings also must be FIO2 and tidal ventilation. Tidal volume will be most important. Uh, I mean, one of the important uh, monitoring parameters and alarm limits can be set, especially if you are using pressure control ventilation in a given patient. So to my mind, I would put the end inspiratory plateau pressure and driving pressure as the important settings, uh, the alarm settings required in a patient with ARDS. Very correct. Doctor, doctor, yes, Dr. Shiva, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah. So, so you know, again, like uh, Dr. Kanchi had pointed out in his first uh, answer to the first question, it is important uh, to know uh, which kind of ventilator you have and which mode of ventilation the patient is on. For example, if the patient is on, say, a pressure control mode of ventilation, right, right. then uh, monitoring the uh, low minute ventilation alarm and the volume alarm would be important. Yes. In a, in a pressure control uh, mode, what would happen is the uh, uh, maximum pressure on the ventilator, uh, the pressure control plus the peep level, that would be a surrogate for the plateau pressure. And so uh, in pressure control, monitoring that uh, upper level of pressure and monitoring the tidal volume and the minute ventilation, that would be the important things. And of course, in volume control, there uh, the high airway pressure alarm, because uh, you know the plateau pressure is something uh, which, even though it is measured by most ventilators now, uh, one will need to uh, manually give an inspiratory pause, and um, so it will require uh, the bedside nurse or the respiratory therapist uh, to do that. Uh, uh, inspiratory pause or inspiratory hold maneuver and cross check what uh, compliance value or what plateau pressure value you're getting on the and of course like dr kanchi has pointed out the driving pressure really is a surrogate so plateau, plateau pressure minus peep is what we're doing right. and um, so i think two important aspects one is the goals of mechanical ventilation in order 
to achieve the uh, minimum uh, oxygen saturation that is suitable. So permissive hypoxia and permissive hypercapnia on the one hand. And on the other hand, you want to prevent ventilator induced lung injury, for which I think Dr. Kanchi has already answered. Yeah, very, very correct, Dr. Shiva. I, I move on to a question that is, more, of course, more related to the ergonomics, because, but sometimes you know that some ICUs having one is to one nursing for mechanically ventilated, one is to two for non mechanically ventilated, and so on. Now, what is the influence of staffing pattern and patient load on, on alarm settings in patients on mechanical ventilation? So, uh, you want me to answer this? Uh... Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, if I understand the question, uh, it is about uh, the. I, I, I can, I can, I can modify it a bit. Do you think that the changing in the patient load and the nursing pattern should also should also make us change in do some changes in the alarm settings to make make them more logistically reasonably sound? Um. Yes. I mean, you uh, if. If, for example, uh, you have, uh, say, 10 ventilated patients in your unit, and you have only eight nurses who are capable of uh, handling mechanical ventilation, and then you have a 15 or a 20 bed unit where the nurse to patient ratio becomes one is to two or one is to three, where along with the ventilated patient, she has to also tackle, he or she has to tackle two other non ventilated patients. The settings of the alarms need to be done in such a way that the important alarms are highlighted and the less important ones, like what we mentioned as the non-actionable alarms, are minimized. Otherwise, then you know, things like alarm fatigue and just uh, muting the alarm. So these are all things which may happen. And I think as our uh, patient intensity goes up, the number of ventilated patients in the unit go up. I mean, it is common experience that uh, events are more common. And so therefore, but I don't know whether, you know, increasing the alarm intensities and making the, because finally the alarms have to be actioned by the person who's at the bedside. Correct. So whenever, whenever ultimately there is a noise or an, the, the, the responses of the, based upon the intensivist. Yes, Dr. Kanchi, would you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah I would like to add, uh, I think in some countries, the respiratory therapies around the clock uh, attending the ventilated patients. So in which case uh, the staffing can be modified probably uh, if we have respiratory therapies for, for example, the uh, situation which was quoted in this uh, discussion about uh, eight nurses for 10 patients, if you have one respiratory therapist. So probably we could uh, um, let the nurse concentrate on other uh, requirements of the patients and to some extent, uh, delegate the responsibility of respiratory management to respiratory therapists. I think in some countries, respiratory therapists are playing a huge role. And we need to consider whether this should be, this can be supplementary uh, help can be provided with these uh, you know, healthcare professionals on the bedside. Yeah, it's, it's very true that respiratory therapists play a very big role. And, and maybe the, that can be thought upon rather than changing the alarm settings. I move on to another important point, Dr. Murlidhar. Yes. On, 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 on this non-actionable alarms, one of the primary reasons for non-actionable alarms are the alarm artifacts. Can you tell us something about the alarm artifacts and what are most common reasons they occur? Uh, the if you ask about artifact artifacts or the um, events which are not really existing but they are alerting the healthcare um, professional to an event which is not actually existent to my mind that is the definition of an artifact and uh, what happens when we ventilate these patients is that there is condensation of water in the tubings or some secretions which may uh, sometimes because of the movement of the air uh, is uh, occurring in the airways, this may be sufficient enough to cause triggering and may initiate uh, the uh, respiratory activity and uh, lead to excessive ventilation. This is one of the artifacts which are which is commonly seen. And, and also, yes, this happens, especially if the flow sensors are very close to the endotracheal tube, 
or if you have a faulty flow sensors, this may cause uh, the um, unnecessary triggering and increased ventilation, minute by ventilation. This is one of the artifacts which we have noticed in some of the patients, especially when you're using water bath humidifiers. And in some patients who have uh, epicardial pacing, sometimes if they are very close to the phrenic now, it may cause uh, diaphragmatic pacing and lead to excessive ventilation. So these are some of the artifacts which I have noticed in my practice. Very, very true, Dr. Dr. Bhuli. Dr. Shiva, many people, who, those who work in the ICUs for long, complain of alarm fatigue. Now, how much of this is real? And are there any means one can overcome this alarm fatigue or improve the tolerance to alarm fatigue? So, you know, alarm fatigue is when uh, you're at the best bedside for long periods of time. And um, uh, if the alarm is frequently going off, then uh, you adapt to the noise that is there in the unit. And um, you may not then uh, action even important alarms. So I think one aspect is uh, to, as a checklist point uh, at the bedside, especially during handover, discuss not only the ventilator settings and the condition of the patient, but uh, also the alarms which are there and which alarms the nurse needs to, or the respiratory therapist needs to keep a watch on, or the junior doctors need to keep a watch on. So, so that could be one aspect. And um, if we feel that there are only two or three alarms which are important, so for example, a high airway pressure alarm, a low ventilation alarm, uh, and a disconnection alarm. So, so we focus more on those alarms and try to see to it that there are not too many alarms which are going to go off at the bedside which is going to increase that. And of course, like you pointed out, the staffing pattern also is an important thing. So if you're short of... The priorities of the nurses change, you know, and they are concerned about documentation, about administering the medications. Yes. And so in that kind of situation, I think what uh, Dr. Murli pointed out about having a respiratory therapist is going to focus solely, solely on the respiration. And then is able to tell the nurse also uh, to which alarms to watch for and which not to watch for. Yeah, true. Dr. Murli, I want to ask you another important aspect that we often have a regular time frame within which we observe and assess a mechanical ventilation patient that whether they require that particular mode or whether they can be weaned down or, or whether the modes have to be downgraded, etc. Do you think that it is also important to have such a timeline for assessment of the alarm settings as far as the precision medicine is uh, concerned? Uh, thank you for this important question. I, I think that the ventilator alarms must be assessed probably at least once in eight hours when the duty shifts are occurring. Uh, but this will be dictated by the criticality of the patient. Is there any change in the respiratory status? Is the patient on any uh, weaning mode? And especially during weaning mode, I think the alarms must be a little more critically watched to be able to satisfy yourself that the patient is doing adequately before he's uh, really taken off the respirator. And I would say that the frequency of ventilatory alarm assessment should be done based on the criticality of the situation. But in a given stable patient, uh, maybe once in the eight hours, the alarms can be assessed. What are these alarm settings? And if they are, they are functional, it can be assessed at that particular point of time. Thank you. Very, very, very true, Dr. Murli. I, I go to Dr. Shiva, again, another important question, uh, because it's concerns about the same, we have talked about respiratory therapies. Do you think that all ICU personnel should have equal access to the ventilator settings, whether in terms of setting or whether responding to them? So, uh, you know, I think the setting of alarms is such an important thing. And uh, uh, in our unit, we have observed a sea change after the introduction of respiratory therapists. So uh, I think the setting of alarms uh, should be 
uh, done by the respiratory therapist any change in ventilator settings or any change in the patient ventilator system should be notified by the nurse to the respiratory therapist and accordingly then changes in settings and alarm should be made the respiratory therapist in turn must have a very close interaction with the clinician or consultant now we find it is usually the junior residents either residents working in medicine or anesthesia who are there at the bedside and uh, there may be a senior resident who is looking after uh, the entire unit 15 15 patients and therefore the uh, understanding of alarms and which are actionable and which don't require action is is such an important thing that i am now veering to the opinion that it is very important to have a, a respiratory therapist and it is important to restrict uh, the uh, change making changes in the alarm settings uh, to uh, the respiratory therapist uh, plus the clinician rather than allow uh, and if you don't have a respiratory therapist then if you have a senior nurse who is the uh, in charge for the unit at that time then any changes in the alarm settings must be notified to her by the nurse who is looking after the patient at the bedside otherwise then you know we'll have a lot of uh, problems that may arise at the bedside so i think it should be restricted fully agree yes dr dr murli yeah i would like to add to that we also have what are known as uh, technical uh, alarms which are not due to the patient condition but because of the suppose there is oxygen supply failure or if this power failure or battery draining out when the patient is being shifted so such alarm should never be tackled with by any of the healthcare professionals uh, those those should be uh, left alone only the application alarms with regard to patient's condition and the ventilatory mode or uh, settings may be uh, uh, provided access to the professionals who are at the bedside for example has uh, dr ayer has pointed out the respiratory therapist or a senior nurse may be provided access having said that uh, it also depends upon the the um, experience of the nurse who is minding the patient if it is a very junior nurse maybe any uh, ventilatory alarm setting if she wants to alter it, it should be counter checked with a person either a respiratory therapist or a physician or a senior nurse this would be my um i mean yeah, additional comment on this let's get your point dr tachi another you. important thing which i want to ask dr tachi is that many ventilators respond to a particular alarm in more than one way for example a mini volume ventilation alarm can respond differently spontaneous to demand or to total now in such cases when there are multiple such ventilators how do you standardize them very very interesting question <laughs> and uh, it, it exactly what you have pinned is that the minute volume alarm when the patient is on some sort of a uh, triggered mode where the patient is allowed to take breaths in which case we have two two components of the minute ventilation that is the patient uh, patient's own efforts and the ventilator's uh, mandatory breaths or the contribution of the ventilator for example you have a pressure support mode which may be adding to the total uh mechanical uh, sorry the minute ventilation so if it is possible to separately identify the components of the ventilatory um uh, contribution and the patient's own efforts and uh, uh, it may be worthwhile to adjust the total requirements for that particular patient in a standardized manner Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. So that that that's that's of course a very valid point, Doctor Kanchi, which you have made. I move on to Doctor Shiva or another important topic. Many people and many societies attempted to frame clinical guidelines on how to create the alarm settings, and most of the time they got lost because of poor evidence. And it is well accepted that we can't generate such strong evidence with alarm settings, given the set of circumstances we are in. Now, do you think that there is a possibility or such clinical guidelines for alarm settings can ever develop difficult question to answer as it is you know we know that clinical guidelines usually uh, are based on are not based on very high level of evidence 
most guidelines, even important guidelines like the surviving success campaign guidelines, very few of the uh, recommendations will have level one evidence. And that's why the grade system uses, you know, uh, the how important do you think the recommendation is and how much evidence there, there is for it. So I think if clinical guidelines are framed for alarm settings, even though we may not have much evidence, I think it is important to set out uh, what the uh, recommendations would be in the absence of evidence or in the absence of in the presence of only low level of evidence. I think there should be guidelines to guide us. And I think that there are a couple of very good systematic reviews on this, which suggest how uh, we may uh, go about framing clinical guidelines, especially for respite therapists and clinicians working at the bedside. Very correct. Fully, fully agree with you, Dr. Ayer. We are already running short, and so I don't have, I will ask my next question to Dr. Tanchi, and after that, we will have a common question to both of you. Dr. Tanchi, my next important question is that what has been the recent technique, technological advancements in the, in the alarms? And, what, and can you tell us something about the smart alarms that are being looked for with optimism? Very interesting question again. Uh, and in the recent uh, years, there has been uh, uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence into the alarm systems and ventilatory management. And uh, this is an evolving concept, creating intelligent alarms. For example, we can have an escalating alarm. That is, if it's a uh, alarm which is uh, alerting a physician for a life-threatening um, situation, the alarm can gradually escalate in its intensity. And then uh, such that the physician or the healthcare professional who is next to the bed takes immediate cognizance of that and then attends to that immediately. That is one uh, um, sort of uh, smart alarm. And some alarms can be silenced ahead of time so that it doesn't disturb the healthcare professional or the other patients in the unit. For example, if you want to do a suctioning so that the alarm is silenced automatically once you press the button and after about one to two minutes, it uh, automatically gets reactivated. And uh, the other thing is we can uh, even couple some of the alarm, for example, low pressure alarm and the low minute ventilation alarm can be coupled so that we know what exactly happening at the same time. And the if you feed in the patient's demographic graphic data, especially in terms of calculating the lean body mass, the ventilator may provide the information about the ideal tidal volume for that patient, for example, 6 ml per kg. These are some of the smart alarms uh, which can uh, uh, enhance the patient care at the bedside. That, that really sounds very exciting and interesting to Dr. Tanchi. So Thank as we go, we come to the last question of, of the sh show. And I will ask the same question to both of you. I will ask Dr. Ayer first, that in order to inculcate the sense of alarm safety culture, if you have to pick up five important points, what would be those points? Uh, first important point would be, uh, to mandate uh, the alarm uh, settings being mentioned on the ventilator chart along with the uh, mode and the other settings that we make. So we may not always uh, mention those. Yes. The alarm settings once mentioned on the chart, any change in ventilator settings should uh, necessitate a relook at the alarm settings. And you know, in this uh, aspect, some of the smart alarms which incorporate machine learning may be able to do this in an automated fashion, but that would require a one is to one nurse at the bedside who will be able to interpret how the machine is learning. The next important point would be to bring about a change in the culture of the unit where there is good interaction between the nurse at the bedside the respiratory therapist, the junior doctors, and the clinicians. The rounds and the handovers are an important part. And at that time, the use of a checklist to look at this in addition to the other important things that we look at would be another point. Training and education of nurses who are going to look after 
mechanically ventilated patients by the respiratory therapist or by the clinicians would be the next important step. And then last, like uh, Anirban has already pointed out, and I think he has something in mind maybe about clinical guidelines can, which can be drawn up uh, so that uh, it becomes a ready guide for um, patients, man, uh, for units managing a uh, number of mechanically ventilated patients. Very good, sir. Do, 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 Dr. Murli, the same question, five most important points that you would consider. Yeah, yeah, the, the very, very nice question. Actually, in the intensive care setting, in a patient who is on ventilator, first of all, uh, first rule of thumb, according to me, is to never ignore an alarm. Uh, once the alarm situation is um, alerted, whether it's actionable or non-actionable, the healthcare professional who is next to the patient must identify what is the reason for the alarm, either just before silencing or just after that, the alarm can be silenced and the problem can be tackled. So that is my first rule is never to ignore an alarm. It may be non-actionable, but still I have to know what is the, why it's alarming. And the second, uh, sec second, third, and fourth factors are exactly what Dr. Iyer said. Uh, probably we should document the alarm settings, which has been made at the first instance. And, and although during the handover, the uh, alarm settings must be reviewed and it must be a checklist. Uh, and um, the alarm culture has to be inculcated. That, that would be my answer to this question. Anirban? Yes, yes, Dr. Ayer. Sorry, if I may add a last point. Yes, please. You know, uh, now, uh, most uh, hospitals are uh, NABH as well. And so, you know, having audits and uh, having quality improvement projects right. around yeah. alarm settings, because as I went through the topic, I realized that there are at least uh, four or five important quality improvement projects that I can undertake in my unit uh, with regard to uh, improving alarm safety and culture. I agree. I agree. I agree. That, that, that's of course very true. And, and uh, it becomes difficult. difficult. Yes, it, it becomes difficult to identify where the alarm is coming from because there are syringe pumps, there are monitors, yes. and there may be other equipment like hemodialyzing and dialyzers or something else. So almost all make the similar sounds. So it's, yeah, yeah, we need to identify the alarm quickly and then sort it out. Friends, Alarm settings in mecha during mechanical ventilation have more important than one can think of. It is our judicious decisions. It is our ability to use them that guides us and can convert many of the so-called or so defined non-actionable alarms into really actionable alarms. Thank you for watching us. Be with us at www.icnn.co.in for more interesting stories and more interesting talk shows on every first third and fifth Fridays for Talking Straight and second and fourth Fridays for our news desk. Till we meet again, Shivaratri, Shavar Khayat, good night.